that there would be political sermons being preached aplenty. Can you imagine what people are hearing this morning as they gather? I thought about that as I looked at these readings, and the voice of my wise friend came to mind. First things first, second things next. Then as I looked at the reading, I realized that that is exactly today the theme that the scriptures are, are sharing with us. When it comes to God, keep the main thing the main thing. Moses, as I was trying to echo with the children, uh, just with this fabulous anniversary that's coming up, very, very uh, important, um, Moses said the exact same thing to his, uh, the people that he had led out of Egypt. He said, you know, everything I'm telling you about God's law, God's word, uh, God's guidance and wisdom, you do not have to fold your body in half, starve yourself, or move to an island to get this. Now Moses knew that the people of Israel were about to go into an area where every kind of religion in the world was being practiced. Just like we live in a time when every religion in the world is being practiced all around us. I don't care, I'm even gonna pick it. I don't care if you're even, I don't, from Dallas. It's even there. <laughs> it's everywhere. Open spirituality. We get calls at the office all the time. Can you do a Native American wedding? And I'm like, you know, I don't know. Never done a Native American wedding. What, what exactly are we talking about, you know? And we get into the teepee and the hot stones and the sweat thing, and I'm like, you know, A, I would never sweat in front of somebody else that I'm leading worship for, and B, you wouldn't want to see that at a wedding. So the answer is no, we don't do Native American weddings. Do we do an Old Testament wedding? And I'm like, well, that, that's quite a bit of ground to cover. If you read the Old Testament, there are lots of ways that happens. What exactly are we talking about? And no. No. Um, dove release, butterfly launch, sand mixing ceremony. No, yes, one time, and no. <laughs> um, we keep it pretty simple. You take men and women, we gather them before the people that they want to be with, and we ask God to bless them um, for the rest of their lives together. That's what we do. Um, Moses said, you're going to be going into a place, and by the way, uh, by the way, uh, I, I'm not denigrating Na Native American spirituality. Much of it is really innately very Christian. What I'm trying to say is, we can get so distracted with so many things and forget the main thing. And Moses said to the people, you don't have to go up to heaven to get this. You don't have to go into the bowels of the earth to get this. You don't have to have esoteric wisdom to get this. He said, God's word is in your heart and it's on your lips. It's as deep as the deepest part of us. I think this is a profound teaching. It's a really beautiful teaching. Um, and uh, it reminds me, actually, of one of the songs that we chose. Um, softly and tenderly. Moses is talking about God's gentle voice. Look with me on page 10 and 11. And... Um, and I would like to sing the first two verses of this beautiful song. And just remain seated and enjoy, listen to the words. If you don't know it, listen to it. Those of us that you do, please sing it. Um, let's sing a beautiful song about God's gentle voice speaking in the depths of our hearts.
same message you heard the Apostle Paul. And it was 2013. I went on a, a sabbatical. Has anybody remember that sabbatical? Yeah, six years ago. Just saying. Uh, and, uh, and so I went to Turkey, went to Greece, went to Malta, went to Italy. I followed the footsteps of St. Paul. Very dramatic trip. And I would take his letters and read them out loud uh, wherever it was that he wrote them or who he wrote them to. So Colossae is in Turkey. It's in central Turkey. I didn't know it was in a mountain valley that has a river running through it. I further did not know that Epaphras, who Paul mentions in this letter, was the uh, leader of three Christian communities in the same mountain valley that has a river through it in Turkey. I, I was blown away by understanding that we're not the first ones to have three worship places in a mountain valley. And they were interconnected together. So Epaphras became quite a hero in study of mine. So Paul did not found these communities, his disciple did. And he's writing to Colossae for a very important reason. Epaphras has gone there, it's an ancient tell, it's a huge mound, it's unexcavated. It's one of the only places that doesn't have people living, it's a, uh, agricultural, it's got ads all around it. So I, I hike up to the top, start reading, and I realize I've never understood why Paul wrote this letter. For extra Bible bonus points in the sermon, why did Paul write this letter to the Colossians? Oh boy. Uh, crickets. Theme of the sermon today? Show love. Don't. 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 First things first. Second things. Never. So we're going to get to love, Jim. It's coming. Oh, it's coming. <laughs> Jim jumps ahead to love. Paul's saying, this is new for you. You're so excited, and you're going to spin off and float into space. I mean, this must have been, I don't know, uh, this must have been the Woodstock of the ancient world, Colossae. They were so excited about Jesus, they started getting into philosophical thinking. They started thinking all this stuff, and Paul goes, uh, if you're from the South, hold up, hold up. Hold on. Let's get this right. And he wrote to them these beautiful words. I, I take them from my words to you. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from God's glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience. While joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. Paul's saying, this is not a trippy one-off thing. This is not the latest and greatest. They have religions all around them. And Paul says, be patient and get ready to endure. Get ready to receive God's power and to be transferred into the company saints. This is a higher calling, and it's not what you think. He was getting them ready for the persecution that they would experience. He says, God has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. When we baptized little column this morning, I said to the family, new passport. God is taking him out. He was, he's 10 weeks old. He's an arm baby. Beautiful. He's a wee bear. He's a bonnie bear. And I said, you're being transferred from this world to a new world. That's the gift of God in Jesus. So the Colossians, don't float away into some ether. Put your feet on the ground, get ready for the life that God has for you to live, and celebrate the gifts that we are given in Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that to be a timely message. I read those words out loud and wept on the top of the tell in Colossae. 
It was a timely message in 2013. It's a timely message today to be grounded and anchored, even as God gives us these beautiful gifts. So friends, what a nice segue. As we sang a song and I said to our baptismal family, I hope our little 10 week old little boy gets the gift that's mentioned in our second hymn here for the sermon. It's on page 12 and 13, you know it very well. And uh, can we sing, uh, let's see, um, let's sing the first and the last verse of It Is Well With My Soul. Explain it about who is my neighbor. 
Now, this involves politics, but this is not political. Jesus tells a story. Let me recast it for you briefly. A Jewish man is traveling on the border of Israel. Um, he gets uh, beaten by robbers who come over the border on a major thoroughfare uh, near another, uh, another country. And a member of Hezbollah in Syria is traveling on the other side of the border. You think this story is controversial now? You should have heard it back then. This is exactly what Jesus is saying. And this member of Hezbollah sees the Jewish man beat up, the own priest, by the way, priests never do well in these stories. <laughs> the own priest won't touch him. What does that Syrian man do? He risks his life to cross the border. This is exactly the inference of the story. He bandages the man with the stuff he has, which isn't a lot. He takes the man to a local uh, clinic. He walks into a Jewish clinic with armed guards at the door. This is precisely the parable. And he says to the front desk, I'm claiming this man is a member of my family. Let's get all the controversy in, shall we? He doesn't have health care. I'll put him on mine. I'll pay you whatever you spend when I return. Most scholars suggest that the bravery of that of this story that Jesus is suggesting is if the man makes it to return, he's made a blood oath commitment to care for someone who is considered his enemy. This is the bar that Jesus sets. This is not about boundaries and borders. It is about humanity. And then when he tells that story, he looks at the lawyer and says, which one of the people in this story fulfilled God's love? It should have been the priest. And so often happens, it wasn't. It should have been the religious professional, the Levite. And as so often happens, it wasn't. The person that showed love to their neighbor and even understood what it meant to be a neighbor was the person you least expected. So friends, the question today is not which political party you belong to. The question to me is not how we feel about this or that. The question is... How are we being called to love? Everyone. Who is our neighbor today? And that's where we start our conversation. What did Jesus say to the young man that he, he obviously was in probably one of the best conversations in the Gospels? What does he say at the very end? You heard it like 10 minutes ago. Jesus gave him a shocking command. You go and do the very same. So friends, first things first. Second things never. Go and do likewise.